it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Julie Parker all the way from down under in Melbourne, Australia, where I assume it's already tomorrow. Is it? It is. Yeah, tomorrow it's, morning. It's 3 p.m. here. And what time is it there? Eight in the morning. Eight in the morning. Well, real quick, tell me how the uh, New York Stock Exchange closed so I can decide if I could <laughs> buy or sell a stock. I wish I knew. Since, I have no idea. Since you're already a day ahead, you've already read our newspapers. Julie Parker was the first non-dentist to own a dental practice in Australia. She owned and managed her practice for 10 successful years, increasing turnover fourfold. Julie co-founded Julie Parker Practice Success to fill a gap in the market. She saw that the current practice management programs are often too expensive for small startup practices to afford. The JPPS Practice Management Program is a very inexpensive but powerful program that is specifically designed for dental auxiliaries to learn and implement, making the practices they work tremendously successful. You know, I think it's so cool. We, we make our own luck. So many hygienists over the years tell me, you know, they burned out, they hate their office, blah, blah, blah. I know a hygienist in Phoenix who quit her job, and now she owns a dozen dental offices in Phoenix, Arizona. A dozen. And uh, so that's amazing. So what made you get interested in buying a dental practice? Well, I'd always been a dental nurse and dental receptionist since I was 17. So I was an early school leaver. And then I'd been in the industry for many years. So from 17 to 33, and when I was 33, that's when I thought, gosh, you know, it seems like team collaboration come up with so many solutions to the issues of bringing more patients in and raising the degree of customer service that I thought oh, I'll just own my own practice. I thought it was all very easy. So, <laughs> and then I owned that for 10 years, realized it wasn't very easy, but loved the journey of learning how to do it really effectively. Um, I've been lecturing down in Australia for almost 30 years and it's really changed because um, didn't they let in a lot of foreign trained dentists? Yeah, so we had, it was on the skilled services list of for Australia for a long time. And we also increased the number of universities that we had here in Australia pushing out new grades. And so we have gone through a sharp increase on the amount of dentists out there. And because of that, there's also been a sharp increase in the amount of new surgeries that are opening up. So it's certainly become more competitive. So how many dental schools do you have now? I think it's six now. It's six? I could be wrong, but it, I think it's six. But it's amazing because, uh, you know, Ruth Port from Port Dental Laboratories and her husband, yeah. George, um, yeah. her late husband, George, um, they used to bring me down there. And when I first started going down there every five years, there was like no competition. The problem yeah. 30 years ago for the first two or three times I lectured there is that they everyone was booked several months ahead and they didn't know how to get anybody in. And back then, a lot of them only were working out of one chair. And uh, so they were trying. And, and now, 30 years later, that problem is gone. And now they're, they're trying to, to grow their practice. So, so if, if my homies went to Julie Parker, Julie Parker Practice Success dot com dot AU, what would they find there? They'll find uh, the, the ways that we help practices out. So the main way is our uh, modules. We've created 12 modules. They come in a binder and these modules step dental auxiliary staff through all of the different areas of non-clinical practice management and upskills them so they can take the reins of, for example, their recall strategy, how to increase production, uh, how to track key performance indicators, all these things that the auxiliary staff don't normally, aren't normally the directors of. It gives them the tools and the skills and the knowledge base to be able to be the directors of those things and customise strategies for their own practice. The flip side is uh, thanks to Skype and Zoom and all these wonderful things, there's virtual practice management. So whether a dental practice wants some assistance in uh, hiring a new staff member or implementing a whole new stream of systems, uh, we can help them one-on-one. Uh, -on -one team training all this all the rest of it so we can help them one-on-one -on -one and we do it all online and is it are, are most of your clients in australia or do you also have them in new zealand or canada or around the world or at the moment we've only been working with australia we're hoping to break into new zealand as our next step uh, and I was certainly very interested in um, looking into the American dental market because the number of dentists in America is absolutely enormous. When you consider our countries are much smaller in size, I think you guys have got about 195,000 dentists. Well, we've got closer to 17,000 dentists, so it's an enormous market over there. 
So um, it's it's uh, the United States, China, and Australia are all the same size, three point six million square miles, and yeah. uh, you have what twenty five million people. Yeah, yeah, twenty three, I think. Yeah, twenty three million. The United States has got three hundred and twenty three million, and China's got a billion three hundred million. <laughs> I mean, isn't that just amazing? And my brother um, moved from Kansas to Sydney two years ago. He got a job transfer, and um, there was supposed to be a three-year deal. And within like an hour, he applied for citizenship. I mean, you just can't move from Kansas to Sydney, Australia, and then go back. Um, uh, so I, I'm really excited. I'm lecturing down there uh, next month. Uh, what is it? Uh, June or July? Uh, it's on HowardFran.com, but... Um, God, I just love Sydney. It's one of the only places in the world where every time I go there, I always say, why am I coming back? And uh, my brother lives there. Just, this is just an amazing market. But yeah, the United States has 211,000 dentists who are alive with a, a practicing current license. Um, 150,000 of those are general dentists over 32 hours a week and 30,000 are specialists over 32 hours a week, but it's an enormous, enormous market. The tagline on Dentaltown was with Dentaltown.com, no dentist practice solo again. And so they're dri they're driving to work right now. Uh, we do these shows an hour because that's the commute, but they don't really know what, what to compare themselves to others. Like what are they doing right or wrong? So paint a picture, what is the average dentist calling you up for? What What is their, their problem? And, and what solutions are you giving them? I mean, what what is, what is your typical bread and butter dental case look like? They usually call me because there's uh, an issue with staff training, around staff training. They want to upskill a particular staff member uh, or they want to get more new patients. That then pushes me into giving them a dental practice assessment that I've developed. They fill out this dental practice assessment and what that does is tell me the areas of the business that they're not either tracking or concentrating on or implementing and that's often leading to the lack of staff training or the lack of new patients coming through the door or the reduced turnover. They, that they, so it highlights areas where they can improve and improve every element of their practice. So is that on your website, that assessment training? It is. What, what's it is. Home, the, about, modules, coaching, consulting? On home. On what? On home. On the home page. Yeah. And if you just scroll down to underneath Free dental my dental practice business. assessment. So it's a PDF. It's a PDF. Yep. So so you download that PDF and then fill it out and then mail it to you? Yep, then email it back to me and then I provide an analysis of that and a list of suggestions of actions that they can take. Nice. So when we look at the staff training, and they, they uh, so so you're saying they want to increase staff training, and then what was the second thing you said? More new patients. More new patients, and I've heard you on the podcast many times because I, I love this podcast. I'm one of those people that drive around and listen. That's the first thing I put on is the latest Dental Town podcast. So thank Aww, you. <laughs> thank you. And I totally agree with you. It's a very common thing for dental practices to be saying, I need more new patients, more new patients, but they don't realise that they might be A, ringing up and not being scheduled, not being converted to an appointment time, or they're coming in, but the service that they're receiving isn't strong enough for them to remain loyal, so you're losing them all out the back door. So a lot of what I do is putting systems in place and training in place to make sure that you, when you're getting the new patient calls, but when they come in, they're being converted to an appointment time, and then when they get converted to an appointment time, they have such a great experience that they want to keep coming back and refer their friends and family. It, it's a crazy deal that it takes four new patient calls for the receptionist to convert one into a scheduled appointment, and then the dentist has a close rate of 38% on, we're just talking a filling, just a filling. Yeah. So he has yeah. to get three people in with a cavity before one gets it drilled, filled, and billed. So to get in three, 12 people had to call so that three butts sat in a chair so that one guy got a filling. I mean, 12 to one, it's insane. And then they yeah. think and then they think they need to create a Facebook ad. Yeah, that's right, that's and right. It's and like, dude, why don't you work on the existing funnel? Instead of 12 yeah. to one, why don't you make it one, two at, one out of two? And then when they get them in the chair, uh, um, you know, um, increase your close rate. So, so would uh, do you want to go over each one of your modules, or, or uh, how many how many modules did you say there were? 
So um, the modules within Binder, the Binder that we've got, uh, successfully implementing change within the workplace. So that goes through things like, you know, um, don't create change just for change sake. Make sure it's always for the betterment of the patient, the staff and the business itself and how to get the whole team on board with that change and carry it through. Then we've got creating a vision and culture for your practice, um, what dental patients want, the value, the financial value of every patient, and that's not coming, that's just giving us an indicator of, gosh, we didn't realise how much these patients are worth to us as a practice. So now we understand how much we can spend on trying to attract them into the practice. And it also highlights how much that value goes up when they start referring friends and family. There's another module, the new patient experience, so creating a new patient experience that makes sure that they are loyal. How to increase productivity, uh, key performance indicators. Key performance indicators are something that's, you know, a, a rare few practices actually track anything more than turnover and new patient rate, but there's many more uh, things that you can track to gauge the success of your business. Uh, achieving patient engagement, uh, both in their treatment and in your practice. Recall strategies, marketing, finding and keeping and getting a great performance out of staff. And then the final module in that binder is a growth strategy that I've developed, which is called the 10 by five growth strategy. Nice. So if you're uh, um, Australians, uh, Americans say sales or revenue and uh, the rest of the world says turnover. So that's what yeah. that means. Um, and, and in the United States, the um, average lifetime value of a patient macroeconomically for the country is uh, 6,500. Um, an orthodontist will claim, will get all that revenue and within 24 months, but that's the lifetime revenue of a general dentist and the average patient usually uh, uh, turns and goes out the back door usually in about five. So, so orthodontists pick up 6,500 bucks in two years, general dentists do it in five years. And it just it goes back to uh, that new patient experience that you know we're still old school we talk about new patients because we don't have loyal patients we, we don't keep customers for life um yeah. it seems like all the fortune 500 spends all their money on loyalty programs whereas all the cottage industries spend all their money in marketing what, what do you think dennis could do more uh to to go from minor league cottage industry burning and churning new patients for 50 years in the same town of five thousand to loyalty programs to where Maybe someday I'll find the first dental office in the world that no longer accepts new patients. I mean, I, I still haven't found one. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I just found one myself here in Melbourne. Uh, there's a, a practice that I'm working with, and I, part of the a demographic and competition report that I do, uh, they are one of two practices in the suburb. The other practice, and this practice don't, don't do any marketing whatsoever and only open two or three days a week depending on how the patients are going. And he, you know, the, the typical thing, I'm a talented dentist, the work I do is great, I'm not quite sure why I'm not successful. And I rang the competition and said, you know, um, if, you, if I was a new patient, would you accept me? And they said, oh, no, I'm not taking any new patients, we're way too busy. Can you recommend somebody else in the area? I would, but they're hardly ever there, so I won't. So go to the next suburb. And so a lot of it is setting up the structure, making sure that you are available for when patients need you and that your name is out there in some way, not just to sign out the front of the building, but doing a number of different things to make sure that whenever they do need a dentist, that you're top of mind. And, you know, in that sort of situation, everything says that he should be wildly successful, with Joe, but just because there's an unawareness around his availability uh, and a community awareness, there's no community awareness around him, he's failing. But it's gonna be very easy to turn that practice around, that's for sure. Uh, there was a, I was researching, and have you heard of a guy, Thomas Smith? He wrote a book called Successful Advertising, and it talks about these 20 exposures that we as consumers need to get from not awareness of a product to actually purchasing that product. And these 20 exposures go all the way through, uh, I, I'm not even seeing the advertisement, now I am seeing the advertisement, becoming annoyed because of the frequency with which you're seeing the advertisement. Now I'm interested and it goes all the way through to finally having enough faith in that product to purchase it. And that book was authored by Thomas Smith in 1885. So since 1885, we have needed 
these regular exposures to be able to be converted to, into buyers. We think it's all because now we've got so many selling messages coming to us and it's becoming overwhelming and confusing, but that's not the case. We've always needed to have this process of convincing. And so I tend to talk to people practices about this that it's not don't just have the sign don't just have a website do multiple things become it get in people's faces multiple times they won't re react off one singular thing but it'll be accumulation of exposures so the book was called successful advertising by thomas smith yeah in and 1885 what, and what what year 1885 1885 yeah that'd Amazing, be isn't awesome it? because the copyright would have worn off ryan we could just republish that 2017 <laughs> and cross out thomas smith and we'll put uh howard and ryan what do you think ryan that's our new our new plagiarizing business so it, it, it's amazing how you know the more the, the reason the more things change they always stay the same is because you can go from a telegraph to a telephone to the internet on the exact same copper wire but you're mm -hmm. still a monkey with clothes on I mean, the, yeah. the, the, you know, Homo sapien has not evolved anything measurably in the last, I'm sure, 15,000 years. I mean, it's still just a talking monkey with clothes on. So I imagine these, oh, there's a lot of timeless principles with humans. Um, if I ask Dennis, you know, what keeps you up at night? They, they, they never say they're, they're fillings or bonding materials. They, they never say. It. It's always people. It's either the staff or the patients. Um, what it, how do you help? Um, I, I know dentists. They're introverts. They're scientists. They're engineers. They're physics majors. I mean, they're not people persons. How do you, how do you take this um, bizarre natural selection of this small weird group of people who are the only ones who could get accepted in dental school, and then make them be a leader and sell dentistry and motivate and coach? I mean, how, how do you do that? As you know, some people are teachable and some people are not teachable. So if they're not teachable, I encourage them to upskill their existing staff to do the job for them and for them just to walk away from the HR side of things. Somebody else does it better, so get them to do it. If there are people out there that are teachable and they want to learn, they want to master that side of things, I know that was one of my challenges when I first bought my practice and one of the strongest growth processes that I went through was understanding that the, that the management of the people was going to depend on my own level of self-awareness. So the degree of our self-awareness is how much we understand how other people work and how other people think and why they react in the ways that they do. So with the people that find it tricky, sometimes they just need a listening ear. They want to kind of vent what they're talking about, get another perspective. With the ones that actually want to do something about it, then we put a plan in place, you know, have these different communications. I'll give them suggestions on what to say and, and, and how to structure that thing. Because my experience has always been that if you provide a consistent environment of safe, safety for staff, then your management of them will be a world easier. And I really do mean consistent, like don't be very understanding and helpful and supportive 95% of the time, but then 5% of the time rebuff them and say, I haven't got time for you right now. It has to be consistent. Don't say that you're always safe with me, but then sometimes have them feel that their job's on the line if they continue down a certain path. It has to be open communication, clarity in communication and safety, and then you'll get a really good conversation happening where they will understand where you're coming from, you'll understand where they're coming from, and you can try to develop win-win situations. I, I've had the same dental assistant for 30 years, and now when anybody tries to give me a high five, I always flinch because I think I'm going to get slapped. <laughs> she's, been, she's been very consistent. Um, so do the, are the dentists who are not teachable, do they know they're not teachable, or do you just know? I certainly know. I think I think sometimes they do know. I think you know it's one of those sayings that you know if all of your um, situations end up in arguments, maybe the problem is you. Maybe it's not them after all. So I think when they are constantly feeling like they're failing in these areas, or not, not failing, but not getting the best out of these situations again and again and again, I think they do see that as a big barrier. And just them calling me is an indicator that I'm not quite sure if I'm doing the right thing on my own. Uh, there was a book, and I wish I could remember the author. You may remember the, know the author. It's a common, it's a well-known book. Uh, um, I think it was Principle-Centred Leadership, and I read this many years ago, and it is a magnificent book because it brings you back. It's not a, so you're not dealing with, a, with problems from a situational basis. You're coming back and going, what are my core beliefs? What's my core philosophy that I'm going to bring to the leadership of other people? And all of a sudden, whenever problems crop up, you fall back on the principles that you've developed, and it makes leadership much easier.
You know, it's it's the funny thing about marriage counselors. Uh, every marriage counselor I've ever talked to in my practice, I think I have six. Um, I said, well, what do you think about marriage counselors? Is it successful? And they always say, it doesn't matter if it's successful in the current marriage or not. The, the issue is, if they, if they don't solve it and that person doesn't solve the problems, they're just going to carry all that baggage into the next one. And that's why you yeah. see people, every time they're divorced, their percent chance of getting divorced again goes up and up and up. I mean, and it's crazy when you see people who have been divorced like six times. It's like, at what point do you realize that with six divorces that there's some skill set thing you might need to pick up on or learn or whatever. And I've always, it's funny, all the consultants I know, they always say, that they feel like in their career, they're 50% of the time they're an armchair psychologist. And I, and, and I think there needs to be more articles written on a dental town that, um, you know, we always say, uh, get your house in order. Like if you can't make money on root canals, fillings and crowns, why the hell are you adding sleep apnea and Invisalign and going to learn how to place implants? I mean, your, your house is not in order, but a lot of times the man in the mirror is not in order. And I think so many dentists I know that are struggling and so many that I've seen become go from struggling to successful the last 30 years, a lot of them is because they got therapy. They got counseling. They figured out what their issues were. Why, yeah. why were you yelling at staff? Why did you throw an instrument? How come you can't delegate? You know, these, these are all, these, these are all internal things that lives between the dentist's ears. They got to get that fixed. Then they got to get their house in order. And then when they get their house in order and profitable, if, if you want to place implants or buy a laser or a CAD cam, knock yourself out. Boys have toys. Uh, but, um, it, it, the, the, it's got to start with the man in the mirror and then that's yes. got to lead the team and then yes. the team will lead the, the customers. I completely agree with you, Howard. So if there are any people out there that are having troubles with staff members and they realize the communication isn't happening, there's, you know, that they can't generate good conversations around how to improve performance and get, you know, better functionality from people, then stop focusing on them. Focus on yourself, recognize that if I'm self-aware, if I understand myself, I will understand them and so go on that path. A lot of uh, angst around staff is un in unrealistic expectations. So I pay them so they just should do stuff, right? Well, no, like, so double check, get all your expectations, write them down. And then when you look at that list, you go, gosh, these are weird expectations. I kind of didn't realize that I'm I'm kind of archaic in my way of thinking there. Of course, I need to motivate. Of course, I need to inspire. Of course, I need to lead. So become aware about what your expectations are. Be very clear about that and think, is that reasonable to expect that of another person who doesn't own the business to be so passionate about my business? Yeah. And, 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 it's, and I always believe that, you know, like the mafia always said, the, the, the fish rot, rots from the head down. So, yeah. you know, the, the, it, when the dentist is the last person to work and the first to leave, I, I mean, I mean, why, why does he expect the staff to come early and stay late? I mean, when, when yeah. the dentist is, comes in and is down and goes back and shuts his door and doesn't want to um, be bothered or talk to or engage, then why, why is the assistant supposed to strike up a, high, a conversation with the hygienist? I mean, it's all starts at the top. I like what you said first, that if the, if the dentist realized, I'm not cut out for this, then get an office manager. I can't mm. tell you how many offices I've seen that were disastrous and they say, well, I don't believe in the office manager. I'm like, well, you don't, you don't believe in organization. You don't believe in staff meetings. You don't believe in, you know, just, um, I mean, there's so many things you don't believe in. Um, I've seen a lot of offices that used to do the morning huddles for years. Stop yeah. doing it. I've seen a lot of offices that used to always wear the Motorola walkie talkies all day long. Stop doing it. So you, you see a lot of changes. What, what, what's hot and what's not now in, in uh, organizing a, a well-run office? I think Australia has gone through different things. I remember myself, I was a facilitator for a number of years. Uh, Sandy Roth from Pro Synergy used to come down here and lecture as well, and I was one of her devotees. And so we've gone through different things, whether it be receptionist, facilitator, patient coordinator, practice manager. I mean, we've got a wide variance in the responsibilities of a practice manager. It goes from receptionists who've been there for a long time and someone feels like they should have a promotion of some kind so they just label them practice manager now, um, all the way through to somebody that does every part of the running of that business, goal setting, strategies for growth, 
all the HR recruitment, uh, staff training, everything. And that's what a true practice manager actually is. But if someone, quite often I'll get phone calls saying, I've got issues with my practice manager and I have to first ask, what are her responsibilities? Is she a receptionist or is she actually running the whole show? And there's everything in between. So I agree that having an office manager is fantastic. Um, but just you just need somebody of a, of a natural leadership capacity within the business, whether it's the head nurse, the, the dentist, an employee dentist, the receptionist, you need somebody there that is very aware of the culture that you've developed and drives that culture. All the staff, as you were saying, if the dentist turns up late, why do you expect the staff to? The staff will perform to what they see most of the time. So regardless if you've got a list of rules and instructions and practice protocol, if the behaviour of the staff as a, as a group is, uh, is different to that, they, a new staff member, for example, won't come in and start doing the right thing. They'll do, do what the rest of the group do. That's what we do. That's group dynamics. So you said it was Sandy Ross with Pro Synergy? Yeah, have you heard of Sandy? So Sandy, where did she come from? Sandy um, Roth, R-O-T-H. Oh, R-O-T-H. And her, yeah, her husband, uh, Doug Roth, is a dentist. And oh, I just, she, I just <laughs> lectured down there with her. Yeah, she's a mastermind. She's just magnificent. I mean, she used to come here much more often. She's started to come back again now under a group called Marketing Dentistry. And she's a tremendous speaker and she's very talented and she is more on the communication side of the relationship that you build with patients. Now, yeah, I just lectured down there. The last time I lectured, uh, she was in the other room and we went out had uh, dinner that night and a uh, lovely lady. Um, is she a friend of yours? Oh, I'd like to consider her a friend. I just from being part of her groups then when she came down in training, this was, I mean, I was doing training with her 20 years ago now, so a long one, time ago. One thing she told me that uh, just uh, just like whacked me upside the head, her husband's a dentist. Mm -hmm. And they always say that, that, I think it was David Ogilvy, uh, who was the um, godfather, the father of modern marketing. And he used to say something, and Sandy basically paraphrased it, where he said, you know, it's um, the hardest thing is not making a great ad because you make – all kinds of great ads and you and the number one thing in marketing is testing it so you might think this ad is horrible i might think it's horrible but the market might love it and he said the absolute hardest thing in marketing to ever do is to leave a good working ad alone because monkeys always want to change stuff <laughs> and um Which we and she said her husband had just this little bitty black and white ad that said dental implants I think it was like nine ninety nine or something. Just that—that's all it said, and a phone number, dental implants, mm -hmm. under a thousand bucks, nine ninety nine, and um, the phone number. And she says mm -hmm. that she's left it alone for like twenty years because every single month, four or five people call in, and they're 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 looking for implants. And uh, yeah. that is so uh, fascinatingly genius how everybody wants to uh, oh tinker with something that that's good and it's, and it's working. Okay. We're fiddlers. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, man, uh, that that was amazing. Um, so how do how can you um, how can you start to reduce the funnel with staff training? So four people calls in before a receptionist gets one in the seat. How do you how do you help uh, train that problem? Well, the very first thing I always get receptionists to do is I give them it's a very simple new caller log sheet, and it's just got the first name of the patient how they came to call, so what sort, like did they find us through uh, online or did they just know that we were there through our external signage, so the referral source, what their query is and did they book. So what we'll find from that is, gosh, we tend to never book the people that ring up for whitening. What information aren't we giving them? How can we re refine what we say to those patients to actually convert them into an appointment time? So you can start seeing where the receptionist really needs to have the training. What specifically do we need to talk about with that or train with that receptionist? So she can say, okay, well, if I answer these queries more effectively, of course, you're going to get a higher conversion. So that one tool provides an enormous amount of information. Interesting. Uh, and then uh, when people call and yeah. they, they want to come in, um, what percent of the time do you think uh, it's a capacity problem where the dentist just doesn't have either an operatory, an emergency room, extra room? I mean, 
Are the dentists in Australia, do they usually have capacity? I mean, if you called mm-hmm. up or just walked in off the street, they could seat you? Or is it a, is it a, or is it a capacity issue? Certainly in rural areas, so more outside the major cities and things, when you get more into country areas, the, it's a capacity problem. There are, there's a much higher demand for dentists than there are dentists <laughs> in those areas, as always, you know. But nobody know. Wants to work and, there. and I get it because, I mean, God, Sydney, that is the coolest city. My, my brother, um, he still doesn't have a car. He, he's lived there, I, I think he's lived there three years, and he's like, there's, you just don't need a car in Sydney. I mean, just uh, it's just so amazing. I mean, I'm so jealous. When I'm saying to him, I go down the elevator to the first floor and walk out, and I mean, just, you know, bar, restaurant, grocery store, subways. I mean, but the truth of the matter is they don't need one more dentist in, in Sydney. They don't need one. And it's the same in America. They don't need one more dentist in San Diego or San Francisco, and everyone crushing it is in the rural. Um, and the dental schools are trying, um, they, they think their panacea is to try to only accept kids from small towns. Because if I accept you to dental school from Sydney, you're not going to go out in the outback. Uh, but if I accept you from a small town of 5,000 people, you're, you're more likely to go rural. How do you, uh, do you ever, uh, um, do you uh, ever in coaching a dentist say, you, this is really a bad area? I mean, no, no one really needs you here. Have you ever tried to convince someone that he needs to go uh, three hours out of town? Or I haven't uh, because I really believe that all you need to do is do every element a little bit better than your competition and you'll win out. Have your customer service 10% better. Increase the number of services you provide by 10%. Um, and I don't think fees come into it as strongly as everyone thinks they do. I mean, even areas, I know that you've got preferred provide. Do, what do you call it? PPOs, you call them, don't you, over there in America? We call them preferred providers here. The, the number of preferred providers has increased a lot over the last 10 years. And it's a huge element of competition. But it's really that scarcity abundance mentality. If you think it's going to be an enormous problem, it actually, absolutely will be an enormous problem. I always encourage my clients to assess it, do it, do an assessment of the competition in the area, put in place a strategy to help address that, and then forget about it. Don't keep focusing on that. Focus on what you're doing, not so much what your competition are doing. And really, if you are there, evidence is all over. Look at clothing and cars and homes. We definitely pay more money than what we need to to get the things in our life that we want. Where if you can afford it, if you've got the funds there, you are going to buy a better home, even though you don't need the better home. You still have shelter in the standard home, but you buy a better home because you want something better in your life. You want your standard of living to go up. Same is true for dental treatment as well. I don't want to just get a feeling. I want to be. I want to feel good when I'm getting the feeling. I want to be treated well when I get the feeling. So there's going to be a portion of the of the population that says, if I, I just simply don't have the funds. But that portion of the population is always there when they're buying clothes, when they're buying homes and all the rest of it. And even in areas that are lower socioeconomic areas, there's still money there. And you just have to look at the other stores that are in the area and the types of new developments that are going on in encroaching areas to understand that there is money out there. And so you just perceive it from an abundance perspective. There are an enormous amount of patients. There's an enormous amount of money. There's not a finite amount of anything that, if you have something, that means I can't have it. No, we can all have it. And it, this mentality to carry through life is much more prudent, is, is, is much more directed towards your happiness and you actually achieving the kind of success that you want in every aspect of your life. There's so much of love, of wealth, of learning. There's so much to go around. So we don't, it's not at the cost of you that other people have it. They inspire you to get more as well. Um. We're talking about, uh, you know, not having to move and trying to fix something. Um, you know, I've routinely seen hundreds of times where there's two dentists in the same building and yeah. one has a 38% close rate. So that's one out of three. And he's doing 750. The office at the next door, same town, same president, same country, same everything is closing two out of three. So they're doing like a million two and the dentist is taking home 350. I'm thoroughly... After 30 years, I'm convinced that when three people walk in the store, one is never going to buy anything. One is always going to buy. It's just that middle, that one out of three in the middle. And the problem is back to that natural selection where the only people that get in dental school are the ones that sat in the library and got A's in physics and calculus. So they're nerds. 
they'll tell you, I don't like to sell. I, I, I'm, I, I don't like selling. It's a four letter word. I don't like it. So how can you go into an office where they have a one in three close rate and try to get it to a two and three close rate, which that alone would double the entire practice. Not to mention you'd be a hell of a, you'd be twice as good a dentist. I don't care what materials you're, you're lose, using. I mean, if you're a fireman and you only put out one out of three fires and I'm a fireman, I put out two out of three. I don't care what you say. I'm a better fireman than you. I mean, if I'm a policeman, I catch two out of three bad guys and you only catch one out of three bad guys. I'm a better policeman. They would, they would double the success of them as a personal dentist if they just doubled their close rate. How, how do you help an office double their close rate when the dentist says, I hate selling? It's education. We don't rise to the level of our expectations. We drop to the level of our training. So if you're not happy to where you're dropping to, increase your level of training and it will be a higher degree of acceptance rates that you get. Understand, I mean, I don't know, I, I often ask practices, have you, when was the last time you asked the patients what their opinion was? Why didn't they buy or why did they buy? And it's a very difficult question. People aren't comfortable asking their patients that, but they're, in every practice there are a group of patients that you could comfortably ask that question of. Why do you keep coming back? Why do you accept the, patient, the, the um, treatments that we offer you? So also don't think about why aren't they accepting, but go to the people that are accepting and say, why do you accept? and start implementing training around that so all of the people within the practice get that and that becomes one of the systems that you use to fully engage the patients in their treatment plans. But there's also around the selling concept, I understand and I totally appreciate that I personally don't like selling either. And as you know, it's just a mindset shift. You're you know providing value rather than selling them something, you're improving their life and all the rest of it. But when we're working in a medical industry, there is a responsibility for us to impart upon that patient the education, the information and the impact that not receiving proper dental care is going to have on their life and for them to provide informed consent. Sometimes dentists are so scared of the selling perspective, they fail to indicate to the patient what the impact on their life is going to be if they don't go ahead and get that tooth replaced where something was just extracted, for example. And the patient is unaware. So because of the dentist's reticence around selling, it can actually affect the patient's ability to provide informed consent because they simply don't, they still don't know, they're still unaware of what the, what the impact on their life is going to be. So there's a responsibility for dentists to become educated around this, to become comfortable and change their mindsets around it because only at that point can they more freely just give the information without any expectation of a yes or a no, just freely give the information so that patient can provide informed consent. How common is having a hygienist now in Australia? Does every Very dentist now, yeah. does every dentist usually have one? No, I wouldn't say every. I I wouldn't say every dental practice has one, but more and more practices are implementing hygiene programs. Absolutely. What what percent of the dental offices in Australia you think have the seventeen thousand dentists have a hygienist? I have no idea. So it's going to be a purely a pure guess from my perspective. Um, quite possibly, it may be reaching up to half now. It's about a half. Actually, when you're talking to Americans, you can say it's absolutely half because we love fake news. We just love <laughs> fake news. You know, we, we, we only want to read what we want to believe. So just say it is exactly 0.5012%. That was Julie Parker at Australian <laughs> Fake Dental News. Uh, so it, it's, it's about half. Um, what, you know, uh, it, it's so um, sad because so many dentists love their hygienists. But she's in there all day long and she's talking about her children and her husband and her sewing and her knitting and her hobbies and her church. And then you go into another office and the hygienist is just passionately talking about gum disease and oral health and the oral systemic link and this and that. And at the end of the day, one hygienist is generating two or three or four times the production of the nice little lovely Betty Sue. And, um, yeah. and, and, and I think the dentist doesn't know it because he only knows his office and he thinks she's an adorable lady. Hell, she runs the church choir. Um, but then you go next door and it's a, it's a $2 million practice because they're just, uh, I, I know, I know a hygienist. I mean, some of these hygienists are just, I mean, they're just obsessed with teaching oral health and, and all that stuff like that. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, a, how, how do you approach that? I mean, how do you go in there and say, 
you know, I, I listen to your hygienist all day long and, and she uh, uh, talks to herself all day long. The, um, I've seen some fantastic hygienists in action, as, as you're describing now, who really do. They promote hygiene all the way through the appointment time and others that are much more relationship driven. And I think there is a lot of fear uh, just from the feedback that I get from dentists when they do call. I want you to come on board, but don't upset the staff. I want you to come on board, but let's not put too many changes in place. Let's do this very, very slowly. And I get that. That's totally understandable and great. It depends on how desperate and dire things are. Sometimes you have the flexibility to be able to have a bit of time and roll different changes out and slowly shift the mindset around the hygienist and their approach to their appointment times and you can do that so other times it's more desperate quite often dentists ring as a last resort and you've got to get change happening really quickly so the number one thing is that we have to make the patient happy we need to make the staff member happy we need to make the dentist happy the most important thing to keep happy though is the business if the business fails nobody's happy and everyone's losing a job and going to look for work somewhere else so if it's not viable for the business the business ends up making the decision for you and if the person you do your very best to make sure that person feels supported and they're going to receive the training that they need to be able to change the kind of conversations they have in their practice help them by role play Playing, get them really comfortable with providing a different type of experience before expecting them just to snap their fingers and go ahead and do the different experience on the very next patient that comes in. Role playing is an enormously effective way of team training. So provide them with as much support and conversation and clarity around expectations as you can. If that person is going to be too uncomfortable and it ends up leaving, that just seems to be the way it is because she'll find a job that she's much more comfortable with. Quite often people don't want to extend themselves out to that space and that's totally fine. But the business viability, if that's being deemed that we need a stronger performance in the hygiene room, then and this is the kind of person that we need to deliver that performance, then you just need to do that. So... Um First impressions are set and led. You never get a second chance to make a uh, first impression. Um, what, mm -hmm. what tips can you give on that new patient experience so that their first impression uh, just crushing it? I tell this story it's, um, because a lot of people think if I dress everything up beautifully, then we're going to make that wow first impression. Uh, and other places, you know, say, you know, I've, I haven't, I've got limited funds. I can't make my waiting room look, the, look like the Taj Mahal. I, I have to do work with what I've got. There was a practice that I walked into. It was a relatively new practice. It had only been open for a few months. And I walked in and it was absolutely beautiful. It was laid out, the waiting room was laid out like a cafe. So it had, rather than couches and individu individual chairs, had coffee tables with a couple of chairs, about six of those around, had an industrial-sized coffee machine by the wall so you could have real, you know, proper coffees and cappuccinos and all the rest, had an iPad station with four iPads there. So if you wanted to go online and search and things, you could do that. The floorboards were all this rustic, lovely, homely feeling. There was uh, oils burning. You had the beautiful music in the background. Everything was top notch. I looked over at the reception area and there was a chalkboard underneath and it has all these beautiful uh, messages and smiley messages written on there, very welcoming impact was enormous. I felt num like number 10. I felt like this is 10 out of 10. There were two receptionists in at the reception on their computers. Neither of them had a patient in front of them, neither of them on the phone. Both of them ignored me. And I stood there like a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a bunny. And I counted eight seconds is how long it took them to one of them to acknowledge me. And it wasn't with a big smile. It was just, you know, head up. Hello, can I help you? And I felt that enthusiasm that I originally had when I walked into that space, I could literally feel it drop, 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 drop with every second that went by. So you, the new patient experience isn't about spending a whole, amount of, whole lot of money. The new patient experience is literally all these lessons that you keep hearing over and over again. When the new patient walks in the door, smile broadly, very welcome. Howard, how are you? Come on in. Make them feel welcome, offer them tea and coffee, have a conversation with them, make them feel included in, in this space now and try to tack, tap into their unconscious, their subconscious mind. So consciously they're aware of the things around them. But there's going to be a whole bunch of subconscious stuff that's going on for them. We've got our five senses all working. We're smelling, we're hearing, we're tasting, we're touching. We're, and we want to make sure that the smells that they're smelling 
are pleasant, that what they're seeing is pleasant, that that the when they're sitting on the couch, that that's a pleasant experience and it's not a hard chair, it's a nice soft chair or a couch. And if you can't get rid of sterility smells and all that so, and the sound of drills and things like that, start introducing different stimuli into the space that makes them good, feel good somewhere else. This is where coffee's fantastic because normally you're having coffee and it's a pleasurable experience and so the smell of coffee is in that subconscious brain as something pleasurable. So introduce that into the practice because you're trying to get them to feel relaxed and calm and harmonious and things like that. So that element of that new patient experiencing and how that, how you make them feel will have an enormous impact on how quickly they trust, whether you they find you likable and their acceptance of the treatment. That that third that you're talking about, that need to be, that will be influenced either one way or the other, just constantly do things that you're going to try to get them to be in a space. You're creating an environment for them to accept the treatment plan and to engage with you. You know, every restaurant knows that the hostess with the mostest. You put your best people person right up front. I mean, even Walmart does it with yeah. a greeter. Even Sam Walton knew that in 1962, that the first person you see should be a greeter out there. And just even with just some old man making minimum wage just to, to smile and wave and press the flesh. And what's amazing is I know of a, a few offices where the receptionist, not only the hostess with the mostest, she's the worst person on the entire team. And another signal for that is she's been there for 20 years and none of the assistants and hygienists stay two or three. So it's like the doctor and the receptionist have been there for probably 25 years and everybody knows all the specialists, everybody around knows that, um, that she's a disaster, but he thinks she's the greatest person in the world. And that is another sign. I mean, if you're having staff turnover problems, but yeah. there's always only one employee in common, maybe it's you. But yes. if there's, and I, uh, agree with you. I mean, maybe it's it's a dentist is a problem, but if, but if yes. you got a, a, another person on the team that's been there 25 years and no one else made it five, that might be Jekyll and Hyde. And there's a fear. There's a, in those sort of situations, I definitely come across uh, two types of situations that I always encourage people to try to change. There's the bad employee he's not really performing well and alienating patients and staff is the person that's been there for 20 years but because they've been there for 20 years the dentist thinks if that staff member leaves i'll lose patients and it's just it's simply not true it's simply not true and the amount of damage you're doing in the meantime is not worth it so it ends up being they feel a bit blackmailed in the sense that you know i have to keep this bad person i know they're bad for business i have to keep them because i'm, I'm going to lose even further but they're already losing so you you it will only improve when you've got you have a great team involved on that new patient experience you said I'd like to hear music playing uh would you go with the bgs or men at work <laughs> i'd go men at work i love colin hay <laughs> Man, I'll tell you what, Sarah, I'm not even kidding. When I went to uh, Australia, uh, I lectured, I don't know, four, five, six times, and, uh, but one time I was just walking around, and they had a uh, Ministry of Tourism. Yeah. And so I, I went in there, and I, I told the lady, I said, you know, as an American, you should have the Bee Gees Hall of Fame. It should just be a museum for just the Bee Gees. I mean, it, that, was, that was truly one of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time. Oh, for sure. I mean, sure. just just crazy. And what what are they down to? Just one one BG left. What well, there's one. yeah, three brothers have passed. Three. There were five altogether, or four. There were four, four altogether. Three have passed. Wow. And so it's only Barry now left. But now so, Barry's doing music tours with his son. So did Barry do the uh, best drugs or the least amount of drugs? <laughs> That's right. Well, did did he have higher bad, quality obviously. drugs, or did he just uh, not do as many? And uh, and who's the uh, who's the uh, better uh, if you could only have one new patient in your dental office? Uh, would it be Mel Gibson or Russell Crowe? <laughs> well, Russell Crowe would be a problem if we got him upset and he had was close to the telephone. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, those are just two legendary actors. I mean, I can't tell you how many times uh, they yeah. just uh, they just crush it. Russell Crowe Russell Crow was born in New Zealand. And we, we claim him as our own. And Mel Gibson, I think, was born in America. I think he was born in America, but we claim him as, as our own. Australians claim many people. <laughs> and it's funny, you, actually you, tell, and you, tell, you tell Dennis all the time um, uh, when they're managing staff is you don't shoot the messenger. You know, yes. your, your, your team can't be afraid to come tell you some really bad news. And, 
and a lot of people don't tell them about it. But then when they go to Hollywood, I mean, I mean when you use your iPhone, uh, Steve Jobs, that was an incredibly must have guy. It's, it's weird how, how some of the greatest actors in the world, personally, are almost batshit crazy. Um, you yeah. know, uh, Mel Gibson, Russell Crowe, um, Tom Cruise. I mean, how could you be a nuttier <laughs> fruitcake than Tom Cruise? But when you go to his movie, it's like the best movie. It's like you need to treat your staff to the same standard you do your Hollywood actors. I mean, um, you know, uh, you just can't shoot the messenger, whether it's in music, uh, whether it's in movies, whether it's in your staff team. Um, so um, do you think I want to ask two questions. Do you mm -hmm. think for the average person, I know there's no average person, but do you think they'd be better off with an office manager instead of the dentist doing it? And do you think they'd be better off with the treatment plan coordinator presenting the dentistry instead of the dentist student? I, I know that. I know there's a lot of variables in there, but on average, do you think the office manager runs the office better than the dentist? And do you think the treatment yeah. plan presenter presents and sells and collects the money better than the dentist? Yeah, I think I, an office manager is definitely more effective, not because they may have better skills or better abilities, but they're available. The dentist isn't available when they're in the surgery during the dentistry. And to be a manager, you need to be able to be out there to manage. And it's too much of an expectation. I feel like it's unfair to expect the person that's got their head in someone's mouth the majority of the hours of each working day to have the to be able to shift that focus from clinical to human relationships, to be able to do it in very short snippets of time and to be able to do it really effectively. I mean, one of the strongest things that I always did as a leader was when people come to me with a problem, uh, if, I, if I, more often than not, I would say, leave it with me for a few minutes or a few hours and I'll get back to you because you need time to ponder and to evaluate each particular thing and the ramifications of each particular problem to be able to very intelligently lead in that space. But to expect dentists to do it when you're catching a snippet of moment here, there and everywhere in between patients and to be able to come up with all the solutions, I think it's unfair. So I definitely think an office manager, an office manager as well, the further learning she's going to be doing is around the management of the, of the practice. The further learning that the dentist is going to be doing is around fillings and adhesives and cements and everything else like that So, and techniques. So it's the to be able to be a great performer is what Tony Robbins says, you know, the can I principle, constant and never-ending improvement. To be able to constantly and never-ending, to be able to perform at a constantly improving space, you need to have that training. And it's the office manager that's going to be having spending her time doing that. You know, a lot of these, uh, probably 85% of everybody listening right now is uh, driving a car. So what I like to do is I like to um, retweet my guest uh, last tweet. So if they're on Twitter, then go to my uh, at Howard Fran and, and find you there. So it's at JPP, JP practice success. She's, JP practice, and then she spells S U C C E because they, she ran out of space. Uh, but, yeah. um, and I also like your blogs. And um, when it, you said you were trying to enter the American market, you should start posting your blogs on Dental Town because I there's, will. A, there's a, a neat thing on the Dental Town blog is um, we made it so um, if you like the blog or if you're reading um, Dental Town magazine online, I think the greatest gift a dentist can give someone writing an article for free is hit the share button. You can share it on your uh, social media, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your Twitter, your Pinterest, um, and Google Plus, I think is the only ones we have. Um, but um, um, lots, it's, it's really nice to see how the shares are going up. And what's amazing is before we start doing the shares, it was hard to tell how popular the blogs were by, by the comments. And what's amazing is so many people, like there'll be a blog, there'll be no comment, but it'll have like 23 shares. Yeah. Um, and then someone will write an article on Dental Town Magazine, which you can also read on your smartphone. And there was no comments, but there were like 127 shares. And so I think it's one of the part of that sharing economy where people read something and they say, you know what, Julie, that, that was a great blog. They just share it to their friends. It's like, I, yeah. I found this good. I want to share this with my uh, buddies. And you people out there, uh, think about that. When, so, when someone writes an article of, on Dental Town Magazine or a blog and, and you like it, share it because, uh, um, that a lot of people spend a lot of time writing these blogs and a lot of these articles. And I, I see that on Dental Town. I mean, you would not believe what goes into some of these articles. I mean, some of these guys worked on it for a year. 
Wow. And, and they were, and they didn't like the pictures. So they're getting the patient back in for more pictures and this and that. I mean, there, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot going on behind that sauce. Uh, but I do like a lot of your tweets. Uh, use this time management tool to tackle the projects that really matter. Um, um, you uh, five ways to boost your enthusiasm. I thought that was a great article. I did not know it was all of them were just five different types of beer, and. Uh, <laughs> So just alcohol. That's what you're recommending to increase enthusiasm, just plain old yeah. alcohol. So um And I'm very enthusiastic with alcohol. But with the blog, I do suggest people I will post them on Dental Town. Thank you for that invitation. And I do encourage people just to have a look at a few because there are helpful hints and time management, how to get more new patients, how to be more successful with recalls. But a lot of my blogs are behavioural. Why, like, it's a study of why certain things upset us and how we can change our behavior, how we can become a better leader or a better performer, and, and getting the best out of ourselves and uh, clarifying the under, and understanding about why we do the things we do. So, they're only short, they're only, I always try to restrict them up to under 400 words so they don't take long to read. But I do encourage people if you are in a space where you're managing other people, and we all are, the minute we're working in a team, we're managing that team, we're have, playing a role in that, have a read and see if you find them useful. I think you will. Yeah, I, I enjoyed several of them. Um, last but not least, um, what sometimes on, on Dental Town, you know, when you go to under practice management and you read the forms, uh, it seems like one of the most common scenarios is the dentist can't decide whether he should let someone go or keep them. Are there any parameters or ballparks when they're trying to get that wrap their head around a decision? Uh, I think the class called it, should I stay or should I go? Um, you know, uh, <laughs> Any any advice on when you're sitting on the fence? Because the employees are the most important, whether you own a hockey team, a cricket team, a football team. I mean, if you have the five best players on a basketball team or a dental office, you're going to win the yeah. championship. So then they yeah. know that in sports, but they don't yeah. really think it like that in their dental office. But what would you say to some dentist? She's driving to work and she's saying, God, I just can't decide on Sally. Yeah really easy this is really really straightforward if you pr provide sally with clarity around what you're expecting her to do this is how what i want you to how i want you to behave this is the kind of result that i want you to give this is the kind of performance i want you to develop deliver what training do you need in order to do that i will provide that for you as well we'll meet up again in three months and we'll have an assessment how well you're going with that if you're not going well we'll tweak everything we'll give it another go and if it doesn't improve then then ask them to move on and get somebody else in for that role. It's I see too often people being fired for bad performance, but there hasn't been strong clarity or strong training to support that person. So provide clarity, provide training, check in again, make sure tweaks are made, modifications are made if they're needed. But then after that, if it's still no performance, then switch that team member over. Well said, very well said. I, I always say it another way. I say, uh, if you fire someone and they're in shock, you're not only a bad boss, you're a bad person. Yeah. I mean, they had car payments, house payments. I mean, they're, they're, their life is leveraged and this just hit them like a, you know, out of nowhere. And yeah. so it just completely lack of communication. And the problem is um, social animals want to be nice to each other. I mean, they just find it very, very stressful to have an uncomfortable conversation, which is kind of weird because when you look at success, <laughs> Um, I think a lot of successful people are not right in the head because they're willing to have the most the most highest number of uh, uncomfortable conversations. And when you really read these autobiographies, some of the greatest CEO legends of all time were insane, like, like Steve Jobs. Yeah, I, I mean, read yep. his book. No, no one was saying he was a nice guy and he <laughs> led the entire thing, but it was communicating expectations. Uh, if he didn't like it, you would know it. I mean, he might throw it at the wall and yell names and all that. But it's amazing how uh, – um, and it kind of reminds me of that basketball, uh, Jimmy Knight. There was a uh, – was it Jimmy Knight or – who was the basketball coach in Indiana that got fired? Uh, but anyway, it was – it was no, Bobby Knight. And um, yeah. he um, – they, they fired him. He was like one of the most winningest basketball coaches of all time. But they fired him because he threw a chair uh, at a player. But the bottom line is he's dealing with – a lot of 20 year old boys from the hood. And when you look at his record, he was getting it done. And I've raised four boys. Some of them, you know, needed to have a chair thrown at him a few times, <laughs> but it, you know, so it, le leadership is just, uh, it's bizarre because some of the most dysfunctional people uh, have yeah. the most winning records.
But the one thing they all have, whether they're dysfunctional or functional, they're letting you know what they think. Some may be screaming it, some may be yelling it, but the bad managers are, they're not communicating. They just don't yeah. want to have an uncomfortable conversation because they don't, they don't want to be upset. Leadership is bravery. You have to be brave and bold to be a leader, to be an effective leader, and you're going to feel uncomfortable. But your level of discomfort in various situations reduces as you tackle these situations head on. It's the avoidance of the uncomfortable situations that makes your anxiety around it grow and grow and grow. As you are tackling these situations again and again and again, even if you don't get the ideal result, you've got to tackle it boldly and bravely with a lot of thoughtfulness and then you're at the anxiety around approaching future situations reduces down so, so much. It's not a sleepless night anymore. It's a worrying five minutes prior to the confrontation, not the confrontation, but the, the discussion. So, and a helpful thing for me has always been Jack Welsh. I, I admire Jack Welsh enorm enormously. And so I, rather than think to myself, I feel so uncomfortable in this space, how can I make it more comfortable for me in approaching this particular situation? I think, what would Jack Welsh do? I'll go in with that, <laughs> with that intention, with that, that, with that level of leadership. So model yourself on someone better than yourself. And see, he's some that um, business people love him, but, a lot of people, uh, one, one of his policies is that ever at the end of the year, December 31st, he tallies up all the salesman's sales and he fires the bottom 10%. Gosh. And, and, and he says, well, come on, you, you're in the bottom 10%. If, if my HR hiring screening, I got millions of applications. I mean, certainly, I mean, what are the odds are that I'm going to get rid of someone in the bottom 10% and get someone higher? And it's, it's a genius strategy. It works. He proved it. Many companies do it, but God dang, December 31st, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, between Christmas and New Year's to find out that, well, Julie, um, you've been with us for 15 years, and I know <laughs> it's Christmas time, but uh, you did not make the top 90%, and you are out of here. You are fired. I'm not, I'm not a particular supporter of that process. <laughs> but, 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 a lot, but a lot of these policies are brutal. And, uh, yeah. and I, and I, I think part of it also is, um, it depends on what the employees want. I mean, if you don't want to win the Super Bowl, then you shouldn't go play for the hardest coach in the NFL yeah. and who expects you to be there on time, expects you, you know, you know, to pee in a cup and be clean and uh, expects all these things. If you don't ever want to win the Super Bowl, then go play on a loser team. And yeah. some, some, uh, I notice that when a dental office gets bigger and more exciting and more, um, fun, and um, people just come to our office and just leave resumes. I mean, we, we don't have, when people say, well, how do you find a hygienist? It's like, well, we, we have five or six applications all the time. I mean, Wonderful. like like when you go to the a dental course all by yourself versus the offices bringing their entire team and then some hygienist sitting there looking at her team and thinking, okay, the dentist isn't a leader. He's not gonna do any, he's not gonna change anything. He's not gonna get any new technology. And then they see this vibrant staff over here that's taking up two rows and they're all wearing, you know, some shirt that says today's dental or whatever. And they just, it, it, uh, um, success attracts success. It certainly does. And I think sometimes we think that, uh, you know, leaders out there think that if I'm generally good all the time, if I put a really good effort in all the time, I'll be forgiven if I blow up every now and then. But unfortunately, that's just not the case. It leaves its residue mark within the staff and employees. It makes them feel less safe for a start because it's not a consistent work environment. And But also it builds up a bit of a resentment. And you were speaking earlier about the marriage counsellor. Um, uh, and I've read an article about a marriage counsellor who said, if I get people when they're angry, a couple when they're angry, I can do something with that. If I get them when they're resentful, it's a lost cause. And you never want to leave situations alone too long that the staff member ends up becoming resentful. And the only way they're going to open their mouth up when they're angry is if you provide the environment that it's safe to do so. Yeah, I, I think the biggest uh, disastrous red flag uh, in summing up what you just said is the, the, the moody person. Because if they're mm -hmm. up 80% of the time, but then, one, then they're down 20% of the time, the damage they do when they're down, the damage they do when they, they blow up, um, it's not, it's not puffed back up the other 80% of the time. And, you know, I got employees where, you know, a hundred percent of the times I have ever talked to like Lori or Ken or all these people, it's always the same person you're talking to. But then throughout your life, you just know people that sometimes you talk to them and they're all up and sometimes you talk to them and they're all down. And just that stable mood is probably uh, the most valuable thing you could have on a team. 
Oh, for sure, for sure. And I liken it to a body of water. Picture this body of clear, beautiful, crystal clear water. That's all the goodness that you do. That's all the good stuff that you bring to your leadership space and your team. And then you have one bad mood and it's a drop of red dye and it just permeates all the way through that and taints all that clear work that you've done. So do what you can to be self-aware and how to control yourself. It's okay to get cross and angry and frustrated. We all do. But walk outside the practice. Go for a walk. You know, go for a bit of a drive, do something, go to the office and close the door, do something, make sure that part of your philosophy around your leadership is I never let them see the dark side, I never let them see the worst of me, they only ever get the best of me. So um, when I go, to, so does Australia still have the age, I'm 54, do they still have the deal that you can't move there after age 50? I don't know. I don't know. I hope not. It'd be nice to have you as part of our Australian team. No, no, that was, I mean, you couldn't get, I think it was after 50, because you guys have a national, a single payer national health insurance, so they don't want a bunch of 70 year olds, you know, retiring down there who need a bunch of hip surgeries and cancer and all that. But I, I think 50 was the cut up. But uh, um, if, uh, if Trump wins the second election, I think I'll just move to Sydney if, they, uh, <laughs> if I, if I can. <laughs> okay. Well, you thank you so much, Julie, for coming on the show. The only reason this show is so successful is because I'm able to get on guests like you, and I really appreciate you uh, getting out early in the morning and coming on the show. Oh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm so thrilled, and as I say, I listen to you all the time. I suggest to everybody I come across within the dental industry to listen to your podcast. It's very powerful, and you've done so much for the industry, not just in America but over in Australia too because everything comes over across the border. So thank you very much. Oh, have a rocking hot day, Julie.